Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech, night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, reviving one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They're more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is a psalm for the choir director, a psalm of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was chatting to someone recently about God. Uh, Their life was a mess. Uh, Yet they still very clearly said, I believe in God. Everything about their life suggested otherwise, but they were adamant, I believe in God. I suspect that this person had recognised a truth from their environment. You see, they live and work in the bush. They know that there is something big out there that runs the world. Life in the country reveals that we aren't really in control. But that general revelation had not changed their lives. In fact, they actively ignored it. They refused to listen to what God, to that God when he spoke to them and they remained God in their own lives. Now I reckon there are many people like this in our town. They believe in God, but they don't listen to him. They know that God exists, but they don't listen to him. I think they've accepted one of the key observations of life. There's someone big out there who made the world and runs it. I think they've accepted that like many people in our town. But we don't listen to him, and the consequences can be disastrous. We're going to look at Psalm 19 this morning. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it anywhere, anytime. Thank you that it always speaks the truth to us because it is the revelation of your nature and will. Help us to listen to it today. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. I think creation speaks very clearly. The psalmist knows this. In fact, given that the psalmist is David, it shouldn't surprise us that he knows this truth. As a shepherd, he would have seen this declaration by creation every day. As a fugitive soldier on the run in the badlands of the Middle East, he would have seen this declaration of creation every day. As a soldier in the field of war, camping and fighting, he would have seen this declaration by creation every day. As a king in his palace, looking out over Jerusalem, he would have seen this declaration by creation Every day, all of his life, David had looked at creation and David had seen it operating, running and reminding him that there is something big out there. I don't think we're any different, are we? In our town, in our environment, in our workplaces, we see this declaration by creation every day. There is something big out there running the world. Every drought, every flood, every rain event, fire, wind and harvest – reminds us of that truth. There is a general declaration by creation that there is something big out there. But when we look at this poem a little more closely, we'll see that there's a nuance. 
David's use of words in verse 1 should take us back to the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a reminder that creation is orderly, systematic, and thoughtful. God made it all. Moreover, the handiwork bears the fingerprints of the creator. The creation tells us that something big is there, a creator. The creation doesn't speak. Well, it talks about speech, but there are no words. There's no language. There's no dialogue. But just a plain observation of the world tells us that someone or something is running it. But I want us to notice that there is a limit to what the creation says about this big thing, God. Did you notice what creation proclaims in verse 1? It tells only of the glory of God, that there is something most significant out there. Creation tells us that. Creation tells us that in language that is sunset and sunrise and wind and breeze and harvest and drought. And it tells us that something big is out there. It proclaims it, it speaks it and says nothing else. And do you notice that the poet uses the impersonal name of God here for that reason? The big creator bloke out there. And that's important because we as humans can only learn so much about God from looking at creation. All we can learn is that God is really big and really important. But we can't learn who he is. That's important on a number of levels. It's important because it tells us that we can know of God from creation, but not know God from creation. It's like walking down the main street. You see someone there and you can observe some basic facts about them just by looking at them. They exist. They might have combed their hair this morning. They might have a limp or a slip, but that's all you can know. They exist, but you can't actually know them. Their likes and dislikes, what they had for breakfast, their feelings, their birthday, their family, their character, their nature, their mind, their history, their future, unless you communicate with them and more importantly, unless they communicate with you. It's important too because it reminds us that stopping with creation is no way to know God. In fact, stopping with creation can lead down all sorts of false paths. It can lead to the misunderstanding that because I know God exists from creation, I actually know God like my friend that I began with. I can start to think that because creation is all there is to know about God and it's not always that enjoyable and I can actually give up on really knowing God because he doesn't seem that nice. I could actually decide that creation is God and so stop with creation and forget the God it points to. So creation tells me that God exists. Creation tells me, (coughs) excuse me, that God is really big and important. Creation leaves me asking more about God. More importantly, how can I know this God? The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable, altogether righteous. They're more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. I'm at point two on the outline. We know this truth, that we only really begin (coughs) to know someone when they speak to us and we hear them and listen to what they say. And the same is true of God. It's in the words of God that we come to know God himself. And the words of God are wonderful. And now here in these verses, verses 7 to 10, we have a number of different descriptions of the word of God. Six, each is followed by a statement of what that word brings or creates, everything from life to wisdom. When God speaks, not only is the character of God revealed, but the whole of life is illuminated. And that's an important statement to recognise. It's the logical consequence of the first few verses. You wouldn't be surprised, would you, if the words of God who made all things then reveal how life should work. We should expect his words to do that. 
But the personal impact of that is something we sometimes miss. And we need to notice what David does here. No longer does he refer to God with that big creator God out there word. Now in these verses, verses 7 and onwards, David uses the personal name of God, Yahweh. I've noticed this at funerals. I take a few funerals. and The eulogy is usually given by someone who knew the deceased much better than me. In fact, they reveal that those who knew this person will often use certain names for them or nicknames, and only those related to the deceased closely in a deep personal relationship could know those names and use them. To some extent, that's how the name Yahweh operates. It's not a nickname. It's not a familiar name. Instead, it's the name God people use when they're in personal relationship with him. And in that relationship, God speaks and reveals who he is. Moreover, God speaks and reveals so that life is understood. More significantly, God's words give life. They come from the creator and they give life to the creation. God's words revive the soul. God's words are trustworthy. God's words bring great delight. God's words shine a light. God's words are reliable. In fact, God's words are more precious than any human possession or even the sweetest, loveliest, most nutritious food. And the psalmist summarizes his experience of God's word in verse 11. In addition, <clears throat> your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. God's word brings life, and God's word warns and keeps. God's word reveals and rewards. God's word is crucial. This is so important for us to remember. It reminds us that we can only know God through what he said. God has spoken. What he has said, every single word of it, revives the soul, reveals his nature, requires life to be lived as it should be. This is gold and greater than gold, greater than anything we might pursue. I wonder, is that our attitude? to the book sitting in our laps. It's not as if we know God if we don't listen to him, is it? If we don't take God's word seriously. How are we going to know God if we don't even read his word? We cannot know God separate from what he's spoken, which leads to a very important question. What human has ever kept these words from God. I'm at point three on the outline. You see, the most consistent thing we do with God's words is that we break them or we ignore them. In fact, if we truly listen to what God's word says, that's the inevitable conclusion that the psalmist helps us realize. Look at verse 12. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I'll be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. Do you see his realisation? He realises as he listens to God's word that his very own nature is revealed by that word. He is a sinner. God's word doesn't just reveal the nature of God. It also reveals the nature of us that we are sinners. Uh, If you know David's life, you'll realise how personal these words are. In 2 Samuel 11 to 12, David commits all these sins, murder, rebellion, corruption, abuse, deceit, dishonesty. He's willful in his rebellion against God. He hides his sin. I suspect he's committing sins he's not even aware of all over the sake of an affair and an illegitimate child. It's only when God's word comes to him in the form of Nathan the prophet with a beautiful, beguiling little story that David's rebellion is exposed. This is no impersonal statement about God's word. This is the reminiscing of a man who met God's word face to face 
and was exposed. Moreover, under that realisation, he's driven to request to, to his knees, to pleading with God for help. He asked God to reveal his sin. You see that there in verses 11 through 14. He asked God to reveal and remove his sin. He asked God to protect him from sin. David knows what sin is like, Psalm 51 verse 4. Against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. <coughs> so you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Sin is sin because it is against God. That means God is the one offended and wronged by sin. That means God is right to judge sin. That means, most importantly, God is the only one who can expose our sin and so forgive our sin. And so in Psalm 19, as God's word exposes his sin, as David comes to understand his sin, David turns to God alone who can forgive his sin and asks him for help. Is that how we read God's word? Does God's word convict you of your sin? It's important to ask that question for two reasons. First, that's what God's word should do. If it's not doing this in your life as you read it, the problem is not with the word of God. Second, perhaps God's word is not doing this because, to put it simply, we're not being exposed to God's word. We're not, not actually reading it not opening it, not listening to it. If God's word is convicting you of sin, and it always will, then it is also a great encouragement because it turns you back to God so that you ask God for forgiveness because sin is committed against him. Now, that leads to a very important question. Is there any hope that our request will be granted? I mean, David sounds pretty confident there in Psalm 92 that he will be cleansed, that he will be forgiven. Can we be so confident? I'm at point four on the outline. And in order to unpack that a little, we've got to recognise who and where we are. We're not Jews sitting in Jerusalem hearing this psalm in the temple. We're Christians sitting in Narrabri saying that we follow a bloke called Jesus. What, if anything, could we take away from this psalm at least the encouragement that we could be forgiven? The key thing is to recognise the role of Jesus in this. <coughs> Between us and this psalm stands the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, after his resurrection, Jesus himself stated very clearly that all of the scriptures, the whole Old Testament, including the Psalms, is about him. Luke 24, 44, Jesus told them, <coughs> These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Now that's a significant statement. It's a reassuring statement. It's the key for us as we come to Psalm 19, to the whole Old Testament, I need to recognise when and why it was written and what it says. But then I need to ask myself, how does this point to Jesus? More importantly, how is Jesus this psalm? In the case of Psalm 19, the importance of words is crucial, isn't it? Words, as we've heard earlier, are how God reveals himself. His words reveal him. To know God is to listen to his words. So when John writes this about Jesus, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, and in John 1, 1 to 5 makes that clear, and then John 1 verse 18 says, the only one who has known the Father is the one and only Son. We then look at Jesus and understand that's the word of God. That's the revelation of God. Instead of just words, God himself puts words in flesh and then walks amongst humans and talks with them and lives with them and teaches them and confronts them and saves them. That's why Jesus is called the Word, the most complete and greatest revelation of God ever. 
If that is true, and it is, then when we look at Jesus, when we hear Jesus, when we comprehend what Jesus says, what do we learn about ourselves? Well, we learn that we're not what God designed us to be. We are sinful. And if that is true, then the words of John in John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, ring true. Jesus came so that we might be returned to God, be forgiven of our sins, and be called the children of God. Jesus came to reveal God. That reveals our sin, the fact that we are far from God and have rebelled against him. And so Jesus comes to deal with our sin as God in the flesh, as God's words in the flesh. He is the only one who can forgive our sins and bring us back to God. Jesus comes to do what David requests in his psalm. As God himself, he can forgive David's sin He can remove the judgment of David's sin. He can protect David from sin. And Jesus can do that for any human being. Can we be confident that God will hear our cry for help, our cry for someone to do something about our sin, just like the author of Psalm 19 says? Well, yes, we can. Why? Because God himself came to do that in the man Jesus Christ. I began with my friend whose life is a total mess, point five on the outline. Yet he still believes in God, but he's hopeless because he doesn't listen to God. He says he's willing to do anything to fix his life, but he can't do a thing, can he? Except listen to God, hear what God says, and turn to God through Jesus Christ, who will forgive his sins. All this man must do, all any of us can do, is listen to what God has done and receive it. Otherwise, we have no hope, no hope of knowing God and no hope of having our sins forgiven. It is only once we listen to God through Jesus Christ that we can actually join the psalmist in that final request. May the words of my mouth And the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Having heard God, having been forgiven by God, knowing God through his word, Jesus Christ himself, then we can actually ask God to help us live in a way acceptable to him, which drives us back to his word, which is better than gold and sweeter than honey. Let me pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you've given us your word. You've spoken in creation, but you've given us your word, and we have that written, we have that spoken, and most importantly, we have it in the flesh. Father, help us to read your word so that we can know you and know ourselves. Help us to be confronted by our sin, Help us to see that Jesus is Psalm 19 and through him alone we can be forgiven and cleansed and brought back to you. Father, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you as you have saved us. In Jesus Christ alone. Amen.